and you're on and you're ready to start smoking. Okay. But she looks amazing too. Oh, thank you. She's too young to be my mom. I was just starting your voice. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for being here. My name is Kim Rice, and I am a wellness coach and certified gluten practitioner. And I have something here today that transformed my life and that of my son, Samuel. It's a very simple tool. You're probably very familiar with it. It's a fork. <laughs> By changing what I put at the end of this fork for myself and for my son, it transformed our lives. I personally think there's nothing more important in this day than what you choose to put at the end of the, your fork. It could save your life. And I'll tell you why I feel this way. This was me six years ago. I was obese. I was depressed. I had terrible anxiety. I had insomnia. I had what I call night terrors, which are like a, a level above nightmares. I would drink people were killing me. It was terrible. I had heart palpitations. I had chronic body pain. I could barely get up and down the stairs in the morning. I was in physical therapy at Kaiser. I had uh, knee and joint pain. It, it was awful. I was, you know, 42 going on probably 70. It was, it was awful. And through what I call divine intervention, some information came to me about an elimination diet. It was a little article, and besides the fact that I had every symptom listed on the article, um, I decided that I might give it a try. I knew I had a lot of allergies, and I thought, well, I'm going to give this a try. So I jumped in 110%. I don't know what came over me, but an elimination diet is when you take inflammatory foods off your system. So I took off gluten, dairy, soy. Um, I also challenged eggs, which I later found out I had issues with. <laughs> took out all artificial you know, flavorings and additives, color dye, anything that wasn't natural. And a friend of mine friend of mine said to me, so Kim, basically, if you don't, uh, if you don't, what do you say, p pick it or kill it, you don't eat it. I'm like, exactly. Yeah, I don't eat things made in a lab anymore. So the results were transformational. I lost over 60 pounds, which was just a side benefit, by the way. It was not my original intention. I was more concerned with the depression and the body pain. And then I lost depression, I lost anxiety, I lost insomnia, I lost my body pain, 90% of it. Um, I even, my allergies even calmed down. Um, at the time I was use, um, had asthma and I was using an albuterol puffer. I haven't used one in six years. I'm off of allergy meds for the most part with the exception of a little blip in the spring when something blooms, I don't know what it is, but where before, this diet, I was so allergic that I literally could get, come to a person's house that had a cat and with that I swear a foot of the door, my allergies would flare up. I was, it's like my body was on hyperdrive. Now I can go into the house of a person with a cat and as long as it doesn't get in my lap, I'm okay. It's like my, my body has just begun to calm down. So the next part of the story is the most precious part. I was on the diet for about a year, doing great. I thought I think I'd lost 30 or 40 pounds at that point. And my son, my youngest son, Samuel, two and a half at the time, was diagnosed on the autism spectrum. And at the time, I knew nothing about autism, absolutely zero. And so I immediately began to, to research and uh, ask people questions and so forth. And what I found through the journey is that there are parents who were doing diet intervention with kids on the spectrum. And I, when I started to read about the diet intervention, I realized it was the exact same diet that I was doing. No gluten, no dairy, no soy, no artificial anything. And so for me at that point, it was a no-brainer to put my child on this diet. So I went ahead and did it. And I didn't tell my husband because I was a little afraid that he would stop me. Um, in the house uh, for about that past year, everybody had been call referring to me as the hippie in the family with my brown rice and quinoa. I was eating so differently from everybody else. And so I just, this, I just did it. Samuel was at home with me most of the time, so I just transitioned him. He transitioned beautifully. He was eating asparagus and broccoli and sweet potatoes and doing great. And this is what happened. When Samuel was diagnosed at two and a half, he had 20 words that he used one at a time. He also had a long list of other autistic traits as well, but his speech, his speech delay was what, what caught my attention. So when he was diagnosed, he was diagnosed at the level of a one and a half year old, so one year behind in speech development. Another problem that Sammy had that I had not related to the autism or diet yet was chronic constipation. He'd had it since birth. I think when he was around uh, two months old, he went 20 some days without a bowel movement. It was terrible, and I didn't know what to do. I'd been on the phone with Kaiser, and 
it, it was terrible. So the first thing that happened when I put Sammy on the diet is his bowel started to move every single day. It was like magic. And I jokingly tell people, the more he pooped, the more he spoke. His vocabulary busted open. He started putting two words together for the first time. It was nothing short of a miracle. It was so dramatic that my husband, who didn't know I'd changed his diet, came to me and said, what's up with Sammy? He's speaking all of a sudden. And I said, I know, I changed his diet. So it was miraculous in our house. Within, I, within a couple of weeks, it made a huge, huge difference. And then between that and the, the autism therapy that we moved forward with, within I would say six to nine months, something like that, for all practical purposes, he, he appeared to be a typical child. And so now, and actually I wanted to show you my picture of Sammy. There he is at, at birth. That's my, he's my youngest child. Here he is at two and a half when he was diagnosed on the spectrum. And here he is today. He is six and a half years old. He's been mainstreamed from kindergarten with no assistance, which basically means they see no autistic symptoms and he is, he is just like every other child. So my son, this past January, was officially graduated from his IEP, which is in a sense his recovery stamp, meaning we see no autism here, no need for special intervention. So people will ask me, okay, Kim, Sammy had autism, you had depression and this long list of other stuff. What's the common link between these two things that the diet helped? And, it's, and this is the shortest way I can put it. Digestion and inflammation. Because what happens when we're putting food into our body that is either toxic, for whatever reason, a chemical, something made in the lab or whatever, or something that we're sensitive or allergic to, and they are two separate things, it causes inflammation in the gut. And so what happens is you can, over time, develop what they call leaky gut. Has anybody heard of leaky gut? Yeah, intestinal permeability is the official name for it. So then what happens is these undigested food particles begin to pass through the intestinal lining, which are not supposed to. Because normally this lining would keep, let, allow nutrition through, keep out the bad stuff, keep all the toxins. So then what happened, especially with brain function issues such as autism and depression, anxiety, is this undigested food particles begin to pass through that leaky gut. So actually, gluten and dairy within your bloodstream take on a narcotic effect. So it, it, um, your body is like it's on drugs. And that's why a lot of these kids, you know, I'll talk to parents with kids on the spectrum and say, oh, I could never do the diet, my, all my kid will eat is pizza. And I'm like, that's the problem. That's the problem. It's the dairy and the wheat that's impairing their brain function and, they, and messing all kinds of things up. So what happens when these, this toxicity and the undigested pro food particles pass through the gut lining to get into the bloodstream, your body does as it should attack it. That's what your autoimmune system's for, to attack it. But then what happens is, depending on your genetic makeup, a number of things can happen to you. So, so as soon as that particle passes through the bloodstream, an autoimmune issue is born. So depending on, on, on what your, your genetic background is, it could be celiac disease, arthritis, diabetes, thyroid issues, Hashimoto's. My, by the way, let me go back to arthritis here, runs on both sides of my family. Both my grandmothers were very, I had a lot of body pain towards the end of their life. Also, both of them became diabetic towards the end of their life. So that's something for me I had to be conscious of. Depression also ran in the family. And for Sammy, and of course, brain function down here, I have, you know, can be as light as brain fog, depression, anxiety, all the way to autism and schizophrenia. So it's, you know, a spectrum in terms of how it affects you. For Sammy, his uh, schizophrenia runs in his father's family. So that's why it manifested as autism for him. And it's a long list. So what happened? Um, so what happens to our food? People ask me all, all, all the time, what's wrong with gluten? People, you know, Jesus, my husband said, Jesus ate bread, what's up with that, you know? So, um, not the bread today. <laughs> that's what I said, and excuse my slang, but I said, excuse me, honey, this is not the bread, this ain't the bread Jesus ate, that's what I told him. <laughs> so our food and our diet has changed. How many agree with that? Definitely. Um, our food has changed, we're doing stuff to it in labs. Um, our diet has changed and our environment has changed. Think about how many chemicals have entered our environment in the past 40 to 50 years, in terms of cleaners and insecticides and all that. My, my grandfather, who lived to be in his 90s, um, 
didn't have all that stuff. That wasn't a part of his life, you know. So, and look at, this is the, has everybody heard the, the SAD diet, the standard American diet? I don't know if that was intentional, but I'm like, it's about right. Yeah, so processed carbs and processed meats, fruit, few fruits and vegetables. This is the mainstay of our diet. Convenience, fast food, packaged foods. So if you look at, how many remember this, this pyramid? This is what I was taught in school. And look at this bottom line. Six to 11 servings of bread and grains. That's what we were taught. Now this is the new one. So now they're saying 25% should be grains. And not even necessarily wheat. Could be rice, millet, sorghum, buckwheat, whatever. So it's changed. And I believe this is a big cause of what's happening with us. We're eating way too many grains than we were ever meant to eat. Plus a lot of them are processed. So this is my grandfather in his 80s gardening. He scratched out a garden wherever he could until he could no longer. That's the way, that was his life. He grew up on a farm. You raise your food, that's what you do. So he naturally was inclined to go and do it wherever he was. Matter of fact, he, and he, or, he farmed organic by default just because that's the way they did it. They did, their family didn't know about these chemicals or probably couldn't afford them. So everything was organic by default. This is how my grandfather saw chicken for dinner. Yeah, he plucked a few chickens in his day. This is how my son sees it. Now, my son eats organic chicken, says organic on it when I buy it from Costco, but it's in a package. I mean, my son was shocked when I told him that chicken used to be alive. You're kidding me, Mom. You know, he didn't know. And so you think about how different my grandfather's life is compared to my son's. And then we wonder what's happening to our bodies. So, you know, Hippocrates said, let food be thy medicine and medicine be thy food. So instead of looking at drugs or other things to, to help my son and to help myself, I looked to food because I thought it's, it's the basis of everything. We are what we eat. So that's where I began. And for me, it solved many, many of my problems so I didn't have to go to medication. So step one, what did I do? I removed potentially inflammatory foods to help cool the inflammation in the gut. So <clears throat> I like to show this list because it goes over all the highly inflammatory foods. These are the top allergens. So look at the top here. You've got dairy. Dairy is number one on that list. Gluten, number two, which is, includes the gluten from wheat, barley, and rye. Soy is number three. And of course, the list goes on. Now, when I take my clients through the elimination process, you know, we definitely these three come out for sure th during those 30 days. The rest of them, I tell them to be aware of it. So if in a couple weeks you're not feeling significantly better, we need to look at your diet and see what else on here could be causing a problem. And the reason why I like to show this list too is look at some of this stuff, nutmeg, you know, uh, garlic, chocolate. These are top allergens. Most people wouldn't think about that. And also, I added nightshades on there, too. This is uh, notorious for causing body pain. And I'm just learning about this, but I understand it's the lectins that are in them. And they're also, it's in a lot of natural foods, but it's also like in beans and so forth. So if you have a lot of digestive issue when you eat beans, it could be the lectin issue. But a lot of people with body pain will take nightshades out, and it goes away. So what is gluten? Gluten, gluten is the protein molecule of wheat. So this is the top, the flour from the wheat plant, the mature plant. So if you were to break this open, there would be a gooey substance in there, which is the protein. So that's what the gluten is. And actually I had a, a, a friend who was raised on a wheat farm. He said as a kid, they would go out to the field and tear this open and play with the gooey stuff because it was like silly putty in a way. It was kind of gooey. So that's what gluten is. So imagine that gooeyness in your digestive system. Yeah, but it's, it, it's what gives bread that wonderful elastic you know, yummy Wonder Bread feeling is exactly what it is. So, um, and that's why my shirt, Moo Free, Goo Free, because it literally, it, it's, it's goo, and it's the, actually gluten is Latin for glue. Okay, so let me, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the history of wheat. First of all, wheat was only introduced into our diet about 10,000 years ago. Prior to that, we were hunters and gatherers. We didn't grow things. We went and picked berries and nuts and seeds and killed animals, and that's what we, that's what we ate. So I guess apparently, according to um, Stephen Wagnon, at some point, we discovered that we could, we could grow this stuff and we could feed a lot of people per square footage. And it began to help with you know, hunger issues. So it wasn't, you know, introducing wheat into our grasses into our diet wasn't a, a health 
issue. It was an economic issue. It was about feeding the masses. It wasn't based on what was really good for us or meant for us. Today, there's still billions of people in the world today that consume literally no wheat. So again, he said, wheat is not grown because it's the best fuel for our body. It's grown because it provides us with an amazing amount of food per acre. It's an economic decision, not a health decision. So what's different about today's wheat? Let's talk about that. Hybridization. So they're changing our wheat. So here, here's an example. You look at wheat, the original wheat, and how tall it is. They genetically, well, genetically modified is not the correct, the correct um, terminology. They hybridized it to make it shorter. So now you're looking at what about what we see today out in the field. And I've had farmers who ver verify this, said, oh yeah, wheat has definitely gotten shorter over the past 20 years. The reason why they do this is because when it's this tall and they're harvesting it and it gets wet, it falls over. It's harder to harvest. So for, for to make it easier to harvest, they genetically modified to make it shorter. Okay, so easier to harvest. The other thing they did is they increased the gluten content. And I don't know whether this was intentional or just a byproduct of changing the size of the wheat the gluten content increased. So there used to be that uh, the original wheat had 14 chromosomes. Today it has 42. So the gluten content has increased and I believe that our body just doesn't know what to do with it. It's no longer food that it really recognizes. Also in, in, in that extra gooiness is just something our body can't tolerate. So higher gluten content. So now I also like to talk about dairy because um, it falls under the same category for me. As you saw on the list, it's a top allergen. It's also a known inflammatory agent. It's been known to cause mucus in the body. Um, research indicates that over 50% of people with celiac disease or gluten sensitivity also cannot tolerate dairy. That, and that's just the studies. I believe it's actually higher than that. So let's talk about why that is. Well, first of all, casein, which is the milk protein, like gluten is the wheat protein, casein is the milk protein. They're very similar in structure. Actually, I include a little diagram for you. So case, caseomorphine is the milk protein, and gliadorphin is the wheat protein. So if you look here, some of the amino acid chains are very, very similar. So what I've read is it's very easy, especially in a heightened inflammatory state, for the body to confuse the two or to react the same. So if you look at cross-reactivity testing, I know some of you are familiar with that. Dairy is one of the number one cross-reactors to gluten. So if somebody is intolerant to gluten, I tell them take dairy out as well. Also, I know it's hard to see on here, but uh, dairy, and when I say dairy, I mean our mother's milk. Uh, is only necessary for the first three to four years of life. It's full of wonderful fats and growth hormones that help us grow quickly. And then our body stops making the enzyme that breaks milk down around that age because we're then supposed to wean from our mother and go hunt and gather like everybody else. That's the way nature intended. So to continue to drink milk can cause havoc in the body because it's not really necessary. And the hard thing too um, with people come to me and they'll say, oh, I think I have a gluten sensitivity, I'm having cramping and bloating and so forth, I'm going to get off gluten. And that's, you know, very easy to target that and say, oh yeah, it causes me cramps. But dairy, and dairy can cause cramps too, but dairy can also cause eczema, headaches, sinus congestion. So a lot of times when they take gluten off and they're feeling better, they go, oh, I'm okay with dairy, but yet they have really bad eczema or they have migraines or something else. So I always tell people to take dairy out as well or at least you know, give it a, tri um, a good 30-day trial and see what happens. You might discover something goes away. And then w one last note on, on milk. <laughs> Is milk a natural? And whenever I think about food, I think about what did nature intend for us uh, a million years ago? What did nature intend for us? Um, think about it. It's calf food. It's meant for a calf that's what? I don't know how much they weigh when they're born, 100, 150. You know, and then they're meant to go to what, 900, 900 pound big cow? That's a, that's a strong, naturally occurring growth hormone. And we're putting that in our body. And what I've read, the correlation with the cancer is that it's, those hormones are looking to grow something. You got precancerous cells in your body, guess what, it's gonna grow. So I, I'm not a doctor, I'm not a scientist. I don't uh, uh, claim to know it all, but it makes sense to me. It just absolutely makes sense to me. So step two, I removed unnatural substances. So first, uh, GMOs were one of the first things that I took a look at. And just, just f how many are familiar with GMOs, genetically modified organisms, yeah? Um, 
corn, not the sweet corn, although there is a new sweet corn, uh, uh, Monsanto introduced a sweet corn. It's been resisted by the farmers, but as, as you go to the farmer's market and you buy sweet corn, double check with the farmer and say, is this non-GMO seed? Because it is out there and, and, and eventually could surface, and unfortunately, because it's not labeled, we'll never know. But mainly it's the corn that's used to feed our animals and to make high fructose corn syrup. Soy, such as um, soy lecithin as well. So if you're gonna consume soy, and I'm not an advocate of soy, but if you are gonna consume, make sure it's organic. Otherwise it's, otherwise it's hand down, hands down a GMO. Sugar beets, which provide over half our nation's sugar supply. So if you're buying just that bag of white sugar at the store, you're buying a GMO. Rapeseed oil, which is in canola oil. And this is used all over the restaurant industry and very often in salad dressings. So if you're gonna consume canola oil, make sure it's organic. And I actually suggest that you pick a different oil. There's lots of great healthy oils out there. And these two, these two surprised me, papaya and yellow squash and zucchini. Yeah, and you know, when I saw this, I started noticing when I go to the grocery store how perfect the squash and zucchini look. It's a little bit of a hint that it might not be natural. <laughs> so again, just make sure that when you consume these foods that it's organic. So what do we know about GMOs? There's lots of studies out there that say that it's bad, but for me, the bottom line is I needed to heal my son, and GMOs is questionable to me. They say that this generation of children are, will be the first generation that's raised entirely on GMOs, so basically they're a science experiment. I'm sorry, not my son. So, what do we know? We don't know enough. So I took out GMOs, I took out pesticides, so he eats all organic food, additives and preservatives, emulsifiers and stabilizers, color dyes, processed foods, anything made in a lab. I just made sure that what he was eating was real, organic, clean food. And also, um, we avoid acidic foods, such as coffee and black tea, sodas, any, anything with sugar in it artificial sweeteners, processed sugar, and I also limit animal protein. I believe that we consume way more protein than we really need. I was talking about this earlier with somebody. You go to a restaurant, and the meat, whatever it is, whether it's seafood, chicken, it takes up half the plate, and really it should be taking up a quarter of the plate, and vegetables over half. So it's a, it's a perception shift in, in what, what needs to be on our plate. And then, of course, anything toxic. A lot of children on the spectrum have high have metal heavy metal toxicity, whether it's mercury or arsenic or lead or copper or whatever it is. And these are some of the things that we had to look at and address. And I am currently chelating for heavy metals myself. I ran a hair test and found that I'm high in mercury and high in arsenic. And you know, some people will say, well, the body's meant to metabolize some of these, some of these tests, but this is what, the way it was for me. When I got the test, and you can see all the different metals and, and minerals that are in your body. And it shows, you know, that kind of average, and then all of a sudden mercury's woo, and arsenic's woo, you know. I think to myself, something's wrong there. And what I found out through this process is that we have an enzyme in our body called DPP-4, and it is the enzyme that helps break down gluten. Apparently, if you have high mercury in your body, it blocks that enzyme from working, which is our clue as to what was going in my body and why I wasn't breaking down gluten properly. So this could be, I, I don't know for sure, this is kind of an experiment for me, so I'm currently chelating for mercury and, and arsenic, and so we'll see what happens. But these are some of the things you have to take care of, and you know, people will come to me, and they're like, oh, I'm gonna take gluten, and I'll feel so much better, and I'm like, no, it's just the beginning. You really have to address all the sensitivities. You have to look at these things. You have to look at parasites and yeast overgrowth and heavy metal toxicity in your body and really take a holistic view of what's happening and what could be impeding you from having optimum health. So people ask me, oh, what do I get to eat, Kim? And well, so step three, after I address these other issues, I filled the body with organic, real food grown from the earth. So lots of organic fruits and vegetables. And then this is what your plate should look like. Over half vegetables, 25% protein, 25% a non-gluten grain, and that can be millet. And actually, I think I have some slides here on that. Uh, so lots of vegetables. Here's your protein. Uh, you have a choice of you know beans or steak or lamb or organic turkey or chicken, uh, a nice clean fish you could eat. And then for grains, for a non-gluten grain, you could do aramanth, buckwheat, millet, quinoa, brown rice, sorghum. 
you know, and there's, there's another like teff, there's a grain called teff. All these are great grains that you can work with. I just started working with millet, and I don't know why I waited so long, because it's lovely. It's just light and fluffy and very neutral, it takes on the flavor of whatever you're eating. So there's some great alternatives out there. And then of course we did uh, limited organic fruit, and the reason why we limited fruit is because it's high in natural sugar, and we were trying to control yeast in the body. So we wanted to limit the sugars, let the yeast die off, let, which lets the gut, gut lining heal. So we basically stick to you know, berries and cherries, things that are high in antioxidants but in low in sugar. And then uh, lots of water, and I also filter our water to make sure it's clean. So I drink, we drink half our body weight in um, ounces every day. So if you weigh 120 pounds, you need to drink 60 ounces of uh, clean filtered water every day. So uh, what I'm going to ask of you, I'm going to give you a challenge. And I'm going to ask for the next 30 days that you consider the things I've said, take these foods out of your diet, and just see what happens. Clean up your diet. Take the fork challenge. Pay attention to what you're putting at the end of your fork for 30 days and see what happens. It just could transform your life. And also exercise daily so that you can get those toxins out. And get adequate sleep. Into, be into bed by 10 because your body's uh, rejuvenating and detoxing at night. So I always tell people, it's only 30 days. It's just 30 days, and you never know what could happen. So I believe that we have the power right here to heal our bodies, transform our lives, be happier. It's transformational. Just give it a try, 30 days. Thank you. Thank you.